Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Before we start, please observe the following do's and don'ts. Always mute your microphone. Avoid noisy distractions while others are speaking. Switch off your camera. Dress appropriately if you want to turn on your camera. Minimize distractions so you can focus on the webinar. Stay seated and stay present. This webinar is only for two hours. Keep your question minimal and on the topic. You can ask questions using chat option. Associate Professor Dr. Hashim Fazil Arifin, Head of Academic Center, Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, University Technology Mara Chaungan Pulau Pinang. Our speaker for today, Professor Dr. Chihan Kebanoklu from University of South Florida, United States of America. Professors, associate professors, doctors, lecturers, and all audiences. Welcome to the international webinar on publishing in high impact journals webinar series, common reasons for paper rejections in high impact journals. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good morning. This international webinar is jointly organized by Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, University Technology Mara Chawangan Pulau Pinang, with esteemed Journal of Social Sciences and Humanities, University Technology Mara Chawangan Pulau Pinang. This program is now live streaming via IJCHT YouTube channel and IJCHT official Facebook page. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Hashim Fazil Arifin, Head of Academic Center, Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, University Technology Mara Chaungan Pulau Pinang, to deliver his speech. Please welcome. Uh, thank you, Moderator Dr. Nur Rihayah Cik Ahmad from UITM Chaungan Pulau Pinang. Distinguished Speaker, Professor Dr. Jihan Chubanoglu, University of South Florida, Sarasota, Manatee, USA. Respective committee members, fellow acad academicians, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Peace be upon you. Salam sejahtera. Alhamdulillah, let us extend our sincere gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the opportunity to be here today. IJ CHT 21 publishing in high impact journals webinar series 11 June 2021. On behalf of the organizers, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to publishing in high impact journals webinar series. This program is part of the pre-conference webinar and workshop series for the International Joint Conference on Hospitality and Tourism 2021 and it will run from May to July 2021. This webinar is jointly organized by the Faculty of Hotel and Tourism Management, University of Technology Mara Chawangan Pulau Pinang, and our university's general, ASTIM, General of Social Science and Humanities. The main objective of this pre-conference webinar and workshop series is to provide an avenue for academics and students to gain research knowledge and skill that will be of exceptional value. This objective is in line with the common aspiration of higher learning institutions worldwide to equip the academics and students with relevant and up-to-date research insights. Ladies and gentlemen, being rejected is part and parcel of life. This, this is where we grow and make ourselves a better person. It is a good topic of today's webinar, which is common reasons for paper rejection in high impact journals from our distinguished professors. Let us learn from it. And as usual, from my speech, after this, let's start writing. Don't delay daily, don't procrastinate. Let us start writing after this. Till then, sit back and enjoy the webinar. 
Back to you, Dr. Daya. Thank you very much. Thank you to Dr. Associate Professor Dr. Hashim Fazil Arifin for his opening speech. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are blessed to have Professor Dr. Chihan Kobanoglu from University of South Florida, United States of America, as our speaker. But before we invite him, we would like to present a brief introduction video. Now, please welcome Professor Dr. Chihan to deliver his talk. To all attendees, if you have any questions related to today's webinar, feel free to post on the chat box. Please welcome Prof. Dr. Chihan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction uh, and the uh, professor, uh, all of you, and of course, all the attendees uh, for your invitation. I am honored to be uh, doing this webinar today with you all. Um, the, as you know, the title of my presentation, uh, with your permission, I'm going to share uh, my screen. Uh, it is the common reasons for paper rejections in high impact journals. Uh, this is our title. And I'm going to um, just um, start telling you. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to mention a couple of things that my university and my center offers. Maybe some of the audience member may uh, benefit from them because they are widely available, uh, open access. One of them is our MOOC course, Massive Online Open Course, Post-Crisis Hospitality Management Certificate Program. This program is available uh, you can go to m3center.org. It's a seven-week uh, uh, program, self-paced. So you may even finish it earlier. Or if you are not interested in the certificate course, uh, if you are just want to look at the, um, the lectures, they are, again, widely and publicly available on youtube.com slash m3center. Um, and then... Uh, we also have another course, which is just uh, finished. This was a certificate class, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. It was a seven week program, again, 14 hours. Uh, even though the certificate program closed, all the contents of the courses are available, uh, again, on this particular website, mooc.academiacentral.org. Um, or you can go to youtube.com USF College of Business, which is my college uh, where the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management is located. Um, or you can go to mooc.academiacentral.org. There is actually several courses there. They are all free of charge. MOOC is open access. Uh, you can, for example, the one on the right hand side here is using crowdsourcing, which is something that we're going to mention today. Uh, but yet, I will not go in detail, but if somebody wants detailed information about crowdsourcing to collect data in social science research, you can actually do that uh, at your own pleasure. Uh, about two weeks ago, uh, M3 Center at the University of South Florida have actually organized a conference. And of course, we will be organizing uh, another conference with you uh, in September. So I look forward to this. But this one also all the contents, the keynote speakers, as you can see, uh, Jonathan Reynolds from Oxford University, uh, Russ Klein from American Marketing Association, Marcus Rack about TikTok marketing. And so, for example, excellent session on qualitative research with Rab Nawaz Lodhi. These are all available at glossurf.org. If you go to Glossurf, this was about blockchain technology, a panel. We had about a chatbot, chatbots to improve customer service experience. 
uh, and etc. These are all available in the mooc.academiacentral.org. This is not required compulsory. It's only optional. If any of you is interested, feel free to go. Okay, um, we are talking about high impact journals. What is high impact journals? I mean, if I were to ask this question to you, if there is, I don't know how many people we have right now in the audience, but it looks like 125 people, uh, there will be probably 125 different answers. Uh, somebody will say, oh, impact factor 5.0 or more. Somebody will say impact factor 1.0. Somebody will say, no, 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 that's not important. Site score is important. Somebody else will say something. So there is not really a set definition of high impact journals, but there are some indicators. One of them is impact factor, and the other one is site score. Basically, they are very similar to each other, but impact factor are used for the ones that, which is you see on the right hand side for the journal that I am the founding editor, uh, JHTT, Journal of Hospitality and Tourism Technology. The impact factor is 2.79, uh, which is a ratio that is calculated for the papers that are uh, published, let's say in 2017, how many of them are cited in 2018 and 2019? So for two years, site score, same idea, but it's calculated for three years. That's why site score usually is higher because it takes the count of three years citations for a given year for that reason. So as you can see that the site score for um, JHTT is 5.0 for 2020. Uh, it has been increasing steadily. So it's very, very, um, very good um, increase in both of the impact factor is 2.79. This is the first impact factor for this journal because it's a new journal. This is a young journal. It's actually 11 years old. It got accepted into SSCI in its ninth year, which is quite good. We also published three different journals. These are open access journals. They are uh, relatively new. They are not indexed in SSCI. Hopefully, uh, they will be indexed soon. We are working very hard, but they are all open access. Open access means free to submit, free to publish, free to access. There is no charge whatsoever from anybody uh, for these journals. For this reason, if anybody would like to take advantage of them, please go to m3center.org and um, do it. So let's go to our topic, common reasons for paper rejections in high impact journals. There is not really um, a 100% uh, answer to this one, um, but I will tell you some of my experiences over the last 10 years as the editor of now as an SSCI journal, but I also edit three other journals. So, um, it doesn't really matter what kind of journal that you are uh, talking about. Uh, rejection is rejection. I just want to start my talk with you that I, even today, as the editor of three or four journals, SSCI journal, I also get rejected. So this is not the end of the world. It is part of the life. It happens to everybody. I was rejected myself. And I have rejected some top scholars papers for different reasons. And there is a good reason for of them. And we are going to talk about this in this particular um, talk. And before we start, for example, high impact, as I told you that there are some indicators of high impact journals. One of them, the most common one is SSCI index. So, what is SSCI index? SSCI index is not like, for example, high impact journals. It's quite clear what it is. It's actually uh, a company called Clarivate uh, is the company. It's a for-profit company. Uh, and then they actually have different tools. Maybe you may be using those tools. As a matter of fact, if you are submitting a manuscript to a journal, chances are high that you're using Scholar One which is also known as Manuscript Central. So if you're using this, you actually use Clarivit uh, tool, uh, which is right here, Scholar One. EndNote is the referencing uh, system. Publons, probably you also use it. It's the get credit 
for reviews. So you as a reviewer, if the journal that you are reviewing uh, support this, that you may be using this journal citations report is a report, which by the way, the impact factors 2021 will come uh, very soon. Every June, they publish the impact factors for the previous year. So we are gonna hear for 2020 soon. And then of course they have one arm of offerings that they do is called Web of Science. And here uh, we are talking about SSCI. So if a journal is SSCI, is it mean that 100% high impact journal? Um, you know, even though the answer may not be yes to this one, but big majority of SSCI journals are good journals for different metrics. When I say metrics, these are uh, impact factors, which is what is the, the impact of an article is measured at how many times it is being used in other articles. But let me tell you one thing. Is this the only quality of an article or a journal? No, uh, I'll give you an example. I have a very good friend. Uh, her research area is archeology. span She actually goes into very specific side of archeology. span When she published a paper, how many people in the world are working on, um, you know, uh, BC 200 year uh, vases that are found in archeological, you know, um, gatherings. So, that, does that mean that her article is not good, uh, not quality because only one people cite it? Not really, but quantity, people like quantification. They like numbers, they like rankings. And these site factors or impact factors do provide that for that reason, we are seeing that uh, like this. So if you were to count the number of journals, nobody knows this by the way, but some people estimate that there are more than 100,000 journals in the world. Uh, some people say more than 300,000. I really don't know the answer to this question, but what I know in that SSCI index only has about 3,400 uh, journals across 58 social sciences. Remember there is also SCI, that's for sciences citation index. This is same idea, but social sciences versus science uh, citation index are two different things from each other. If you were to look at this, so today, I mean, I can even go into this particular website and try to actually get this. You know, uh, one of the things that we are going to talk here, let me bring this here. You can see that if I were to search the journals, look, uh, in um, the Web of Science group, I am looking at my screen here. I hope that you are seeing uh, also SSCI uh, website right now, uh, that the one that I'm trying to show you. Here, I'm gonna go actually click on uh, SSCI, just SSCI, just to show you that today there are 3,549 journals. So if you receive an um, email from anybody, uh, any journal saying that come and publish in our journal, we have an impact factor of 5.8 please do not believe what you hear because a lot of people are using this impact factor. Impact factor is only calculated for the journals that are included in SAI, SSCI, that's it. And to be able to check if the journal that you are interested, whatever that journal might be, is that you need to come to this official website of SSCI index articles. And you can now look at here and you can actually work to just um, even look at only business uh, articles and you will be able to um, go and look at hospitality if you want. Uh, you can type this if you were to uh, click on the category. For example, I can write hospitality and you will see that in hospitality, how many SSCI journals? There are 58 of them, that's it. There are not 59. And of course, this list is changing. Some of them are de-promoted, so they are no longer SSCI, or the new ones are being added, just like last year, JHTT uh, was added. Are you in accounting? Let's say that your field is accounting. Don't worry, you can come here and click on it, and you'll be able to see, I'm going to get rid of hospitality here, only, only 17. If you're accounting major, 
um, you have only 17 journals that are included in SSCI index. So you can come here, type whatever your area is, history, finance, marketing, strategy, IT. You can just uh, check this uh, by yourself. So let's continue with our uh, presentation here. So we know that there are a um, limited number of the um, journals listed in here. So this is, for example, political science. I found 186. Uh, depending upon our audience, I don't know uh, what they are, which fields they are from, but they will be able to see that in there. So feel free to go yourself to this address that you see and do it. Okay, now we know what uh, high impact journals are, at least in one of the forms. As I told you that there are many different once some people may go to uh, ABDC list, Australian Business Dean's list. Some people may go and only accept Financial Times 50 list. Some people go University of Texas Dallas list. I mean, there's all these different ones, but you will be able to go there and uh, find it out yourself. Chances are high that if a journal is highly ranked in those, of course, they are also ranked among them based on their so uh, impact factor. So you'll be able to see that all around. Also, if anybody is interested, um, um, Clarivate is also providing you that you can use this tool on their website that you can actually add uh, an abstract of an article that you're working on. It will suggest based on artificial intelligence, it will suggest to you the type of journals that you can submit you do it. Okay, we understand. We understand this. How can we publish in these journals? And what are the biggest mistakes that people do that get them rejected from being published? So let's talk about them. And I'm going to give you some examples. These are real examples. The bottom line, at the end of everything, like if somebody is saying that, oh, this Dr. Jihan is perfect. I'm going to listen to his lecture in one hour, and I'm going to be expert publisher. I'm going to go and publish five, 10 articles. If this is the idea, you are not in the right place because I do not have a magic wand. Uh, it's not very quickly. As a matter of fact, if you were to receive an email from any kind of a journal, says to you that come and submit your article to our journal, we will get you published in let's say two weeks. If somebody says like this, stay away from that journal because this process is not very, very quick. You may have known that Ralph Waldo Emerson have actually said that life is a journey, um, not a destination. So I'm going to change this saying here, publishing is a journey, not a destination. It's not just one thing, but you are doing uh, this wonderful university and the uh, conference that we'll be organizing together are doing such a great job by putting this series uh, in this publishing in high impact journals webinar series are uh, very, very uh, good because it's part of this journey. We are in this thing in, in together. Journey means that it never ends, it never finish. You keep learning all the time and every time. So in terms of uh, the, the, as you know, uh, what we always say, publishing is a journey, not a destination, that I would like to tell you that publish or perish is one of the first things that was taught to me when I was a graduate student. They told me that you need to publish or perish because publications is what sets your reputation as a person. And uh, that is very, very important. Okay. Before we go into specific examples of rejections, the, the mistakes that people make, let me tell you some of the um, top ideas. You know, I uh, when I was invited to do this webinar, I just put on my Facebook, maybe some of you on my Facebook, uh, I put there, what is the main reason that you got rejected? Uh, I asked my Facebook friends, I got many, many responses. And I will tell you that one of the top ones that in my little uh, survey that I've done on the Facebook is that the second one, relevance and extension of existing knowledge was number one. But let's talk about them very quickly. Originality. 
what is new about this subject, treatment or result? What do we mean by this is that you need to really look at uh, what is going on in this field. I'll give you one example. I'm in technology, hospital technology, and I have a journal. So I'll give you an example. If you send me a paper, and this paper is about 10, technology acceptance model. How many papers are there in about 10 right now? If you go to Google search, just put technology acceptance model, you'll probably find, I didn't do this, but I, I, would, I bet that you will probably find thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of papers that have been done about technology acceptance model. So if you were to send me a paper about technology acceptance model in your cover letter or in your abstract, you need to make it very specifically tell me why this paper is actually uh, different than uh, before. Because if you're doing the same thing, perceived usefulness and ease of use, cause intention to use technology, we already know that it's been tested million times. So it needs to bring something different to be able to explain why we do these things. So that brings me to relevance and ex extension of existing knowledge and methodology are the conclusion valid and objective. While we are talking about this, we are also talking about the rejection uh, reasons as well. We will see soon communication, clarity, structure, and quality of writing. So you may say to me that, Professor Jihan, you talk about clarity, structure, language of uh, quality of writing, but you are not even born in America. Yes, I was born in Turkey. I migrated to America 25 years ago, and I do write papers, and I do not have to be um, um, first language English. My, my first language of uh, English uh, language doesn't have to be English. Even if my first language, my mother uh, tongue is English, still doesn't mean that I can write clearly. We may need help and we can get help and that's perfectly fine and we'll talk about that. And it needs to be convincing, uh, sound, logical, etc. So there is many different uh, aspects of the title needs to be eye-catching, uh, not too long, not too short. It shouldn't be as this short, for example, 1961, intelligence and experience. Um, or it doesn't have to be this long. You know, these are just examples um, just a title, short title or a long title is not going to get you rejected, but it will not get you cited, that's for sure. So title is important once it's been published, once it's been accepted, that you need a good title so that you can actually get cited by other authors, because when they put those keywords, they need to be able to get you. So what you see here is a research methods class. If I were to teach a research method class, I would just tell you that Dear students, here is the components of a research paper. Title, abstract, introduction, literature review, methods, results, discussion, conclusion, theoretical and practical implications, and limitations. These are the ones, right? That's perfectly fine. And let's just talk about, uh, about some of them in a little bit detail. Does the title summarize the main point of your paper? So please make sure that you do that and also give the editor, give the reviewers, because not just the editor, you know, in a joking side that when I ask people what you get, you reject it. What's the most uh, common reasons? Many people said reviewer number two. So uh, by, by, by just to make a joke, but that reviewer is important because that's who is going to evaluate and editors, um, you know, I'll be very honest with you. Uh, I receive in total more than 1,500, 1,500 papers a year to my journals. If I were to read every single article from top to down, um, I would do nothing but just do this business. So for that reason, we rely on the reviewers a lot. For that reason, you need to really think about when you write your paper, is this going to give the information to the reviewer uh, enough or not? So in the method section, uh, it needs to describe all of the selection criteria um, and make sure that you have the overall answer to the purpose of the study and make sure that everything is logically organized in the results section. And also um, the, in the discussion, you need to make sure that you answer 
the research questions that you have asked with. Okay, so let's talk about the mistakes. One of them, one of the most common one, the research question is too vague, not, in, not really clear or too broad. You are making, I'll give you some examples in a second or not specified. The structure of the paper is chaotic. So you have something here. This usually happens. The second one that I'm talking about here, this usually happens when you actually have a, a paper uh, has been written by four or five different people. When you have like this, um, then the problem is that if somebody doesn't glue them all together, you have this different writing styles. Sometimes there is disconnections between the different parts of the paper that really uh, make the reviewers and the editor upset and will uh, may cause you to get your paper to be rejected. Limitations of the study are not acknowledged. If there is a limitation, you should be the first one to say that this is the limitation and we accept it and we are going to make it better in the next uh, try so that this is uh, probably gonna be better than before the reviewers or the editor find this. Oh my God, look at this one. This research question is not answered. You may, you may tell me, Dr. Jihan, oh, this is not possible. How could somebody write a research question in the beginning of the paper, then do not answer it at the end of the paper in the discussion finding section? Does this ever happen? All the time. I cannot tell you how many times I look at the paper, I look at the research questions or hypotheses, and then I go into the paper and I see that the research questions are ignored. Uh, they either forgot or on purpose or sometimes unintentionally, and they don't do it. And grammar and use of language are poor. Uh, poor grammar, poor language is not a problem. Not fixing it is a problem. You don't have to be an expert English a literature teacher to write a paper, but you need to do that. So research questions need, uh, for example, if in, 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 in case of complex answers, uh, a bad example, does owning a pet improve quality of life for older people? Uh, a better one a research question in this case, in what ways does owning a pet improve quality of life for older people? You become a little bit more specific. Let's look at the second one, the focus. Does medication help alleviate attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD symptoms? And do kids need more exercise? First, first of all, you have two questions in one research question, so that's not good. And you need to be more specific and focused. So let's look at a better way of doing the same research question. How effective are, we are not saying is effective, right? We are just not assuming that it's effective. We are going to find out how effective are the various types of medication in treating elementary students with ADHD because elementary can be different than middle school, high school or adults or, or whatever. And uh, not to ask for opinions. Your research question should not ask opinion. Which national park is the best is a bad research question. A better one is what features do the most popular national parks have in common? In terms of continuation, a uh, little bit more examples for you. Some of the bad examples and a better ways of them. How do artificial sweeteners affect people? When you say that you're not really specific, which kind of sweetener? There's so many different sweeteners out there. And what do you mean by uh, affect people? Which people, women, men, children, or what? A better example, how does aspartam affect post-menopausal women who suf suffer from migraines? So we're talking about this one. Uh, you're talking about women, uh, their status, the age it gives me, and who suffer from migraines. Another example, what are the advantages of descendants of cell phone use in schools? Uh, a better example of this research question could be how does restricting cell phone use in school affect social interaction? So you can look at the other ones. I've provided here some more examples for you and uh, they are um, some of them. Okay, let's talk about some other mistakes that people do uh, when they write. Some of them are already obviously when we 
tell you how to write a good paper. We are also telling you what not to do, right? If you do this, the reverse one would not, uh, would be the mistake. Vague research question and going off topic. Be very careful about this. Many, many journals now, even SSCI journals have reduced the word limit. For example, if you were to submit something to JHTT, you are going to write, tell me whatever that you're researching 6,000 words or less, including references, tables, everything. If you were to submit to Tourism Review, another SSCI journal, which I serve as the associate editor, Professor Buhalis, uh, then you are going to do it in 5,000 words. I get an email from an author saying that, dear editor, I have an amazing article, but it's 13,000 words. Will you accept it? If I accept it, why would I put that in my website? It says 6,000 words. It's 6,000 words. Maybe 7,000 words, I would accept it. But if you were to say something like this, so read the instructions. And if you're targeting a particular journal, let's say that you say that, you know what, my article is really a good fit for JHTT. I'm going to send it Dr. Jihan. If that's what you're gonna say, look at the um, guidelines before you even submit. So 6,000 words, make your paper accordingly. Misformatting the paper, this is what I'm talking about here. Using very complex language. Uh, make sure that you um, can tell the story to anybody who can read, especially reviewers as well. Poor abstract is gonna get you off. Sometimes editors read only the abstract and can reject you, desk reject you based on the poor abstract. Ineffective keywords, this may not uh, cause you to be rejected, but it will again cause you not to be cited. Remember, your paper needs to be cited. One of the biggest criteria, key performance metrics for people is actually the number of citations that your paper get. For that reason, you need to really think strategically. What kind of abstract should I write so that people will cite my paper? They will like my paper, they will download it, they will read it, and they are going to cite it. Same thing with effective uh, keywords. And please do not reveal your identity. It needs to be double blind uh, and do not put the editors in a difficult situation. Usually this happens at the end of the paper, even though my editorial assistant, for example, checks them. Um, but if it is hidden in the paper, I will tell you one example that one author has submitted a qualitative research. As part of this qualitative research paper, he had actually um, in his paper, the quotations from the interviews uh, he has done interviews, and in the interview, it says Professor Jihan Chobanolu is a nice person. Like one of the answers actually revealed the identity of the author. That should not happen. So be very careful. If you want to thank your university research center funding uh, agency, do it after it's been accepted. Uh, unexpanded abbreviations. If you are in technology field, if I were to tell you PMS. POS, GDS, CRS, EMS, you would not understand anything, right? I understand it because that's what I use I, every day, the abbreviations. PMS is property management system. GDS is global distribution system. ERS is energy, reser uh, energy reservation systems, whatever that might be. So make sure that you identify those abbreviations um, and also cross check your paper. Um, many times, and this irritates the editor so much. Oh my God. Please, after you read your paper, because sometimes you add more references, you delete some references, you cut this sentence, this one. Sometimes you add the references and the references stay in at the end, and then but not in the article. So do a cross check. Cross check is that you take your article, put the references on the other side, make them side by side, Look at the art article, the text. It says Chobanolu 2019. Check that if that's in your reference list. This is called cross-check. So all the references in your text should be listed in the references and every references that you have in your list should be in the text. So very simple, but many people don't do it because they are so anxious, excited to submit the article to the journal, but they do not know, they do not know that these are the things that really um, 
make editor, I don't want to say angry, but um, not happy, I should say, because it, it, it just shows me that you don't take your job seriously uh, and then you need to do it. And untranslated metadata, I see that sometimes I got papers from different countries and they have this uh, different languages in different parts of the paper. Make sure that you, of course, translate everything to English if the language of the journal that you're submitting is English. Not proofreading your paper is another big mistake because if you were to read yourself one more time, you would see uh, many things. And I put this here, sending to a wrong journal. You can tell me, come on, Dr. Jihan, this cannot happen. People cannot send a paper to a wrong journal. I'll tell you how many times, oh my God, how many times I receive papers. Look, I'll tell you one thing, Journal of Hospitality Tourism Technology, right? Let's just for the sake of example, you never heard of this uh, journal. Now you heard from me, of course, you're listening this, this uh, webinar here, but if, imagine that you never heard. Okay, so you are thinking Journal of Hospitality Tourism Technology. Hmm. I cannot tell from the title of this journal. I guess it's hospitality, tourism articles. Technology means that it needs to use technology. But so if this is the case, what do you do? You go to my website, right? Just type Google or Baidu in China or different parts of the world, whatever that you're using. Um, and, and then, or DuckDuckGo is a new research uh, search engine now. So you just type it and you go to the website and you look at what's being published, even though this is a not open access journal. In other words, JHTT articles, you have to have subscription, either your library or somehow yourself. Um, open access journals are different, but even if you don't have access to the full papers, you can even look at the abstracts. You can look at the titles of the paper that will give you an idea what is being published. So how many times I get a paper that is has nothing to do? Cultural heritage is sent to my journal. What am I gonna do with cultural heritage if there is no relation to technology? Maybe augmented reality, maybe virtual reality, maybe robotics, maybe um, data mining, whatever that might be, uh, word, e word of mouth, websites. These are all related to technology, but if there is nothing, then that is not good. So continuing with the main reasons for rejection, paper is not well positioned for the journal. What do you do about this? How can you make this? Just like what I said, look at the journals. I don't know, again, we have now almost 160 people in the audience, which is great. I wanna um, ask, uh, for example, the, uh, the, 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 the participants here, if you were to, if I ask you, what is your area? What is your research area? And I am sure that you are going to tell me different things. Uh, but if somebody is doing research in many different fields, that person is probably not an expert in one field. So what I'm trying to say is that everybody should have a main focus area in research. If you are doing, okay, let's just take hospitality for an example. If you are studying today food and beverage, tomorrow human resources, then technology, then strategy, then event management, then lodging management, then travel agency, then this, there's no way that you can excel. I mean, I don't know, you should be Superman or Superwoman. I am not one of them. So for you to be able to excel in research, you need to have one or two, one main area, maybe side area. So for example, if you go to look at Chobanolu.com, my website, look at my research is listed there. You will see a common theme. If somebody looks at this, and I did this on purpose, my mentors have told that to me, just like I'm telling that to you right now. So why I'm telling this to you? Because one of the things that you need to do is that you need to go and pick up some journals in your area, whatever area that you want to specialize, human resources, go and look at some human resources journals and be start reading those things. Because if you do read them, if you do read those journals that you have the passion for, then your papers are not gonna be well positioned for the journal. Um, does not answer so what question. We talked about this earlier. So you write this wonderful paper, but you don't say, why you have done this paper? 
What is the so what? What happened that you did this paper? So that's important. Outdated literature review. Okay, let me tell you, this is one of the, one of the very easy ones for me to reject a paper. I love those kind of papers because they are easiest to reject. You know why? Because I am a technology journal. I got a paper and I look at the references. I look at the references. You know what I do? I do control F and I put 2021 to see if there is any citations from 2021, nothing. No, no, I'm not gonna reject the paper because we are in 2021. That's not a problem. I put 2020 to see that if there is anything from year uh, 2020, nothing. 2019, nothing. 2018, nothing. 2017, six, seven, eight. 2000. So you know what this tells me? That this literature review is outdated. Do you know what happened here? Maybe you can tell me what happened. You know what happened? Chances are very high that this paper was submitted to a journal and waited there for six months, then go into the one revision, two revision, at the end it was rejected. Something didn't go right, the editor rejected, so it, it lost one or two years. And these authors did not update the review of literature, did not update the paper, they just took that paper, submitted to another journal. Now they submitted to my journal. And I see that, a technology article should not have the, the most recent reference should not be from 2017. At the very least, I would like to see 2019 and 2020. So make sure that if your paper is, is rejected and you want to send it to another journal, of course you should, if you believe that's still a good paper and you can fix it, the paper based on the comments. And if you're lucky when your paper is rejected that you are going to get actually some feedback from the editors. and what was promised, what is not delivered. This is the remember, research questions are asked, but there's no answers to those research questions. So that's important. We need to look at that one. Okay, this is a journal article about if the authors check their references. Look at this. They are, they've done, somebody have done the study. Uh, it's an old study, but um, out of the 131% um, of the 150 references, have citation errors. So this is a common problem that you see. A lot of people talk about this, but don't do it. So this is what I'm talking about to you about the cross check. So please make sure that you cross check your papers. And um, here is what do peer reviewers detect? I, I am not gonna tell you, but this is the Royal Society of Medicine. Their reviewers actually did analysis of why papers are rejected. And here is why they are rejected. Look at this. It's very similar to what we already talked, but there are some different ones. That's why I want to uh, go over this very quickly with you. And poor justification for conducting the study. Remember, we talked about this. Number one, this is the reviewers, medical journals. This is not social sciences, medical, but research is research, right? Biased randomization procedure, because it's a science journals, uh, science uh, articles, randomization is very important. If you are doing uh, COVID vaccine, is it effective? Do you want only to um, COVID vaccine to be given to Turkish people, but the water placebo to Germans? No, you don't want that, right? You want randomly selected people to be able to do that. So no sample size calculation reported. Unknown reliability in the, this is methodology por portion here. Failure to analyze the data on an intention to treat basis poor response rate, unjustified conclusions. You are saying that my paper saved the world, but you don't have anything to base your paper on it. And discrepancy between data reported in the abstract and the results, these are important. So here um, we are going, I'm gonna show you now another research article that they have done. This is retraction. You know what retraction means? A paper you submit to a journal, it's been accepted, it's been published. People start citing it, but somebody read that article and they say something is fishy about this uh, paper, something is wrong. And they write to the editor and find out that there is a problem with this paper. And it, that paper is retracted. So it's been actually not anywhere. And there will be a big 
kind of like a sign, it will say this paper is retracted, do not use it. So this study that I'm showing you, this one, actually have done a study of all the papers that has been retracted. Okay, that means that there is a problem with this paper. What are the reasons? Many of them, look, 1329, what are the reasons for this? So my dear participants here, many of you might be graduate students, young scholars. So I want you to publish papers, but don't rush. Don't make mistakes that you see here. Just go, go to, uh, for the sake of uh, publishing your paper quickly. Take the longer road, but do it good so that you do not have this embarrassment in your life. Number one reason that papers are um, retracted is fabrication. So the data is not real. It happens and people find it. Look, 1300 articles have been retracted in these journals that you have seen earlier from these publishers, Emerald, Sage, Elsevier, all of them. So fabrication is number one. Number two is plagiarism. Now, of course, I, for example, every paper that I receive, we send it to turn it in immediately before we even send it to reviewers because I used to do this at the end, but at the end, sometimes I put a paper, it's 60% plagiarized or self-plagiarized. Oh my God. We went through all these things and then now I have to reject this paper. So we submit that to turn it in this plagiarism tool, similarity index, they are called uh, early on. And self-plagiarism, look at the other reasons, duplication, exactly the same duplication or submitting the same article to multiple journals. Please do not do it. Absolutely do not do it. Submit your article to one journal at a time. If it is rejected, then you can submit to another journal. Or if you do not have any hope, withdraw your paper from the editor. Go into the website, click on withdraw, withdraw your paper, then submit to another journal. Statistical error, um, fake reviewer. Um, those are some other reasons why the papers are um, uh, retracted. Rejected, right? I got rejected, I told you. That's okay, no problem. We are learning. Research is a journey. We are not all supermen, superwomans. We learn. It's learning never finish. I learned just recent years, for example, when I was in graduate student, we didn't have a class on conjoint analysis. Now I publish three, four papers. I self taught myself conjoint analysis. I'm learning now different new tools, etc. So rejection by the journal editor is called desk reject. Some people don't like it. I like it better. I like it better than my paper staying in the review process for one year and then get rejected. If the editor is quick, tells me in one week that I'm not going to accept your paper, of course, I don't like to be rejected, but it's better than rejected after one year. Um, at least, hopefully, if the editor give me the, some good reasons and feedback, that's even better. Number one, why do I desk reject? I desk reject also too. Now we become SSCI journal. Our submission numbers have uh, doubled more than increased more than double. So we have to reject because we only publish 48 articles. We receive 400, 500 uh, articles per year. What are you gonna do? Only 10%, right? So the paper is not relevant to journals readers. That's one of the uh, items. You can try to dispute this, but make sure that the journal that you're sending the article has a good match. The paper does not contribute to the new knowledge. We talked about this already. So make sure that you identify how this paper is significant, how it is superior than the others. The paper does not meet established ethical standards. The paper is poorly written or the paper has not been prepared. Like a good example is that 13,000 words for a 6,000 uh, journal, um, journal. And here, this is a, another article that I found uh, why papers are desk rejected. Uh, here's the reasons, um, the, the, some of the reasons I, I have already that you can look more uh, detailed for the time constraints. I'm not gonna go too much, but sampling error is another one. For example, if you are, um, Doing an article about, for example, 
who purchased the video st streaming um, service like Netflix, for example. And if you did the survey between the ages of 15 and 25, there is a mismatch here, as you can see, right? Because uh, 15 and 25 year olds can be the consumers, like they can be the um, produce, uh, users of this service, but not necessarily the purchasers. So you need to be uh, pay attention to this one and what to do, how to do very quickly. Um, how long time do I have? If you please remind me how long time I have left for this portion. Uh, Miss Noor, please. Do I have 10 minutes, five minutes? About 30 minutes. Oh, okay. That includes the questions or the for the lecture part? No, no. Then is uh, for the lecture part only. Okay, okay, good. So I don't have to rush too much then. Yes, good. you're good. Uh, thank you for letting me know. So what to do, how to do. So let's talk about it. So we talked about these rejection ideas, reasons, uh, some of the top things. There are some things that you can do. I tell this to all of my graduate students, all of my students. As a matter of fact, uh, just yesterday, maybe some of you know Faizan Ali. Faizan Ali is my colleague here uh, at the University of South Florida, and he got his promotion and tenure yesterday. We celebrated him, uh, and I serve as his mentor. He is um, like a brother to me because I met him in a conference in uh, Thailand in 2013. Uh, it was Agba conference, and then um, he listened to my presentation. He asked me some very good questions. This is how I get to know him. We start working on research, and. Shortly after that, that meeting, I have recruited him to come to University of South Florida as an assistant professor. And now he's a star, research star, unbelievable. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel called Research Beast, so you can look it up. Uh, many, many uh, good, useful videos. But in um, that particular uh, you know, meeting with him when, when we are doing this uh, in, in, in this part, Yesterday, I uh, reflected on my mentors also. Like he thanked me for being a mentor to him, but I also remember, as a matter of fact, today I just wrote to one of my mentors, which I didn't call him for a long time, I just realized. And I just said to him how much I appreciated him who gave me what you see on your screen. So what is the key to good research? Remember I told you, there is no magic one like this, paper is born, right? Uh, there is a, it's a journey. So this journey starts actually with good research topic. Okay, good research topic, Dr. Jihan. How do I get the good research topic? Good research topic starts with good knowledge of the literature. Oh, I need to read the literature. What do I do? How do I know about the literature. So you get the good knowledge of the literature with a lot of reading. You need to read and read and read. What do I need to read? You need to read journal articles, industry magazines, attend industry shows, conferences, social media. Even social media can be a very good uh, material to fill yourself with research and trends. What is going on in the industry, in the world today? LinkedIn is a good example, for example. I'm not talking about this Instagram, just selfies. You know, people are showing what they eat and where they go. Of course, those are all good. They are, they are needed. They are part of social, but I'm not talking about from the research perspective, blogs, podcasts, talking to industry executives, etc. cetera. Here's some examples of the hospitality journals out here. <clears throat> You can ask me, Dr. Jihan, am I going to read all of these journals? No, you don't have to read all of these journals because there are more than, oh my God, more than 300 journals in hospitality. So if you were to read all of them, there's just no way that you can read any of them. So what's, what's the strategy? My strategy is this. I identify key journals in my area, whatever that your area. Remember we talked about focus area. So identify, I'm a marketing person, no problem. I'm a HR person, no problem. I'm a food and beverage management person, event management. I'm a strategy person. I'm a finance person, accounting person, whatever that might be. 
identify, there are journals in those fields. Remember we were just searching earlier. So identify top three, four or five journals and start reading them. Every time they publish an issue, at least read the abstract. This is gonna give you the idea about what they are publishing. And when you read the abstract and the title, if there are articles that are in your area, then download them and read them uh, on a regular basis. Not just hospitality journals. If you are in tourism field, this is what you see on there, but also general business journals as well. These are just some examples that I found. Uh, obviously, those these ones don't you don't have to read them. Whatever that your interest is, is a good idea. So. And not only that one, but also please read industry magazines because industry magazines publish things much more faster. There is no peer review and also publish in industry magazines as well too. Uh, make a summary of your papers and submit to them. Uh, some people may be scared to do it before it's published in a peer review journal. That's perfectly fine. You can just look at these different um, magazines in hospitality, area, for example, just to give you as an example, lodging, food service, restaurant news, hospital technology, design, hotel business. These are just examples, right? And the good part, almost all of them are free now. You can go and read them or you can do it in, in, the, um, in, the, um, in the business magazines and journals. Again, most of them are free of charge. And um, you see this 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 um, picture, right? Does anybody know what this is? Uh, you probably are noticing this. Uh, some actually cultures don't know this, but if you do not know this, uh, I am going to tell you that this is a chickpeas. Yes, yes, somebody wrote that as exactly chickpeas. So I'm going to show this to you. So you are saying to me that Dr. Jihan, what is the relationship of chickpeas to research? Let's continue. I'm gonna show you one more picture. What is this next to the chickpeas? Kachang kuda. I guess this is in uh, Malay maybe. Uh, somebody writes sed sedap panya. I don't know what sedap panya is, but this is tahini, right? So I have now in my picture, uh, chickpeas and tahini. What am I gonna make? If I show you these two pictures, maybe in hummus, yes, yes, some, uh, only the two people said hummus, exactly. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. So dear participants, if you read and read and read, you will know what this is. This is chickpeas. This is the research in this area. This person have done a research in this area. This person have done a research in this area. So if you have these pieces, okay, if you recognize them by reading and reading, then immediately when I show you two things together, you will tell me that I will make hummus with this. What do you need to make hummus? You need chickpeas, you need tahini, you need olive oil, a little bit lemon juice, maybe water, that's it. You will put that in, you will put in a blender, you have a wonderful hummus, dip it in and eat it. This is what I was telling you about reading and reading and reading. Because if you do read, you are going to get to know, you're going to recognize what you see, and you are going to be able to make wonderful, uh, and of course, put the lemon, and you're going to make this wonderful hummus. This is exactly what I'm talking about. So reading allows you to be able to go to 30,000 feet, 10,000 meter, bird eye view, I call it, bird eye view. Because as you read, or I will give you another example. Imagine reading is understanding the uh, jigsaw, jigsaw puzzle. You know, when we were kids, we used to do jigsaw puzzle, right? I mean, uh, even adults, they are still doing it. So you put the pieces together, and then you make the map or you make the picture. So this is exactly what's gonna to happen to you as you read, especially focused reading, right? You focus and you are going to get to know what these things are. And then you will be able to do what I call gap analysis. You'll be able to look down, oh, this person have done this research. This person have done this research. This person have done. 
But there is a gap here. Nobody has touched this area. Nobody has introduced this variable into this phenomena. I want to do this. This is called gap analysis. As the more you do it, you are going to do it. This is from GHTT uh, again. And if you, if you don't have access to these articles, there's many, many resources like ResearchGate um, then other ones that you'll be able to find. Uh, in terms of methodology, make sure that the, uh, the, the explain the type of research that you did, whatever that you have done. If you use conjoint analysis, tell them why and how, what are the metrics? If you use PLS SEM, one day I never forget, one student came into my office, said that Professor Jihan, I want to do my thesis. Okay, very good. I want you to be my chair of my thesis. Okay, very good. And I want to use smart PLS. I said, excuse me? I want to use smart PLS. I said, why? Because it's very cool. Everybody is using smart PLS. I want to use smart PLS. So of course, this is very wrong way of right, approaching the method because method should not drive your research. Your research should drive your method. So um, for that reason, it's important that the method that you're using has a good justification. Please justify it. How you collected your data? Did you use crowdsourcing? If that's perfectly fine, but justify what did you do to be able to do it? Have you, how you analyze your data, tools or materials used in the research and your rationale for choosing, choosing these methods. These are important uh, to do. Readers need to know how the data is obtained. Uh, unreliable method pr produces unreliable results. So you need to really identify if there is something like this and you need to put that in your limitation. Hopefully that's not major enough to be able to get uh, rejection. And the reader wants to know the data was collected, um, concepted with accepted practice. Now new journals, some journals actually, top level journals, even ask you to submit the data sets. Remember fabrication was number one reason for retracted articles. They don't want this to happen. So they even ask you to submit your data in some cases. So it's important to provide methodology, sufficient information to allow others to use or replicate the study. And there is also crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is perfectly fine. I don't know if you know, but Mechanical Turk is one example, or Qualtrics. To be able to use this crowdsourcing, it's kind of like, imagine like Uber. Crowdsourcing brings the uh, um, uh, survey takers and um, the, the researchers together. And of course, you pay some money to people who take your surveys. It's perfectly fine. And um, there is a editorial that, that I and my co-authors has published in the Journal of Global Business Insights. Um, you can look at that, uh, find this article if you want. These are the best practices. I accept um, articles that are used crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing actually is accepted uh, in even top journals, but you need to take some precautions. And we also have a MOOC, a free course on how to use crowdsourcing for your survey research. So obviously we don't have enough time to go into detail, but um, myself and a couple of my colleagues have actually have created this class. It's free of charge, it's a MOOC. So feel free to go to mooc.academiacentral.org and enroll in this class if you want. And you'll be able to see all of these things that you need to do there. You know this journal, right? Journal of Service Research, one of the top journals in many, many different rankings, it's listed. Look at here, I'm gonna show you some articles in this. Uh, oh. If you go to this, why do I not have it? There you go. Okay, I'm in the, um, I'm writing MTurk there, right? I am in the Journal of Business Research, Service Research. Look how many articles have been published using an MTurk. Many, many articles have been used. Look, so crowdsourcing is okay. That's what I'm trying to say that you will be able to use crowdsourcing as long as you take some precautions. How do you uh, validate the data uh, from there? So this is just a quick um, look into the website of this uh, prestigious journal. 
And effectively, methodology should introduce methodological approach. One more time, indicate how the approach fits the overall research design. Uh, look at these, think about those. Specific methods of data collection, explain how you intend to analyze your results, provide background and rationale for methodologies that are unfamiliar for your readers and rational and of course the limitations as we already talked. Don't include irre irrelevant detail. Unnecessary explanation of basic procedures are uh, no need. Problem blindness, you don't see it. Literature review um, is not dated or enough and it's more than sources of information. And uh, very quickly here, uh, as we have said, there are four different things that you can do. New problem, new solution. New problem, old solution. Old problem, new solution. And old problem, old solution, I should say here, uh, that those are one there. So as I said, there are many different sources of information for your literature to feed yourself. I call this to feed yourself. I give that as an assignment to my students, read an article, one article per day, at least one article per day. So this is uh, our academic article I'm talking about and in your area, that's going to end. Also look at the podcast, look at LinkedIn, look at industry shows, go to the conferences, etc. cetera. <clears throat> and um, uh, we, we kind of like talked about the sources of research problems, um, existing theories, existing literature, social issues, etc. And in terms of literature review, um, the editors uh, want define and clarify a problem, not too long. Remember the word limit. Many journals are now cutting their word limit. Summarizes previous research. Remember about bird eye view, try to go up and make a good summary of the journals and um, Keywords, search engines are looking at these keywords. This is how your papers get cited again, analysis and critique. And make sure that your review literature is compelling, novel, timely, and accurate. So make sure that you always check. And one of the biggest mistakes that people do. Okay, imagine that you're submitting a journal, uh, article to my journal, Journal of Hospitality, Tourism Technology, and you're writing about social media in hospitality. And I take this paper, I look at the references list, there is not a single article from GHTT. But I publish maybe 30 articles on social media. So this is, that should not happen, right? So you should do your homework. You should look at the articles in the journal that you would like to submit. And if those apply, of course, don't, don't do it just to do it, but if they apply, make sure that you cite them. You need to show the editor that you've done your homework. You have researched everywhere. There's not, there's no gap in there. Cover letter, do you need to have a cover letter? Not necessarily, not all the time, but especially if you wanna show short cover letter, don't write long cover letter. Sometimes I get like four or five pages of cover letter. Short and sweet, just tell the editor why this paper is good fit for their journal. Clarity of expression and readability. Um, English is important. Good writing is important, but I am not, as I told you, I'm not a native speaker. Doesn't matter. There are some tools that I use and then you can use. One of them is called Upwork. Upwork is like Uber, kind of like a social um, meeting space. So they introduce you to proofreaders and copy editors. And then of course you pay money uh, there is some cost to it, but it's it's reasonable, uh, at least in 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 American standards. Uh, so, let's say about hundred dollar per paper, two hundred dollars, let's say uh, at the higher rate. Or there is Scribber. These are have nothing to do with me. These are just some tools that I'm showing you. If you are not a native speaker, if your English needs some polishing, copy editing, proofreading, either Upwork or Scribber or Freelancer. These are the three tools that I know. Maybe there are many more. If you know, write it down in the chat so that we can all learn from you as well. So, um, and, then, and then this is the Freelancer. You can just hire them. You can look at these proofreaders, copy editors, they are reviewers. 
uh, the reviews. Other people have uh, done that. So you'll be able to do it uh, very nicely. So the, please think of yourself, put yourself in the reviewer's shoes when you submit a paper. What do they want to see? Uh, what the reviewers look, originality, identify that clearly. Even put originality or significance of the study, write it down with a subtitle. Importance of the work to the readers and show them that this is scientifically reliable study. Length of the paper and reference the section, we already talked about this. Don't make it longer than it needs to be. APA and formatting, you know, this is important even though it's not the sole reason for rejection, but it's important to study the journal that you're submitting, especially if you're taking from one journal and submitting to another journal, make sure that you have. I use Zotero for my references. I don't know if you're using any software, but there is other ones um, like um, Monterey, I, I wanna say, there's many other ones. Zotero is a reference management system. It is working wonderful. And I also have a um, webinar on Zotero. Um, it's on, you can go to chobano.com, you'll be able to find it there. I, I did a detail uh, show you how Zotero, or you can go to Faizan's Research Beast uh, YouTube channel, and I, I think we have published there. You'll be able to find it there uh, as well. It's very, very efficient and nice. Journal selection, we already talked about this. Just to uh, repeat quickly, this is an International Journal of Contemporary Hospital Management. Make sure that you go look at that, see what they publish so that you don't waste your time, uh, all of them. And this is the checklist, quick tips for you to pick the best journal and uh, do not do simultaneous on concurrent submissions. It's important, I wanna tell you, open access publishing is okay, uh, but open access doesn't mean predatory journals. Predatory journals are very harmful. Do not, do not uh, take, um, go to predatory journals. Okay, please, that's very, very important. So um, let me show you here. Look at this email I received. Dr. Jihan, send your paper to International Journal of Engineering Research. Submit in 15 January, five to seven days, you will get the review from the reviewers. 25th of January, we're gonna publish it. Impact factor is 4.61. If you see an email like this, just delete. Do not reply, do not submit. It's gonna hurt you more than it's gonna actually help you. So this is a predatory journal. Um, no journal, no scientific journal will ever publish your paper in two weeks. 10 days actually, not even two weeks. Look, 15 January you submit, 25th of January you get it. Of course, they are doing it for money. These are open access journals from the University of South Florida. They are good journals. Uh, they are not predatory journals. Uh, they are not ranked yet uh, in SSCI or Scopus, but they will be. And citations are important. Um, you know, I got this uh, about a month ago. Right now, I think I'm a little bit over 6,000 citations uh, currently, uh, but it's important, you know, to actually look at what gets cited. And then when you select your research topics, look at the titles and abstracts and et cetera. So this is important to do these things that you see on the screen uh, so that you get cited. Um, and explain why your research matters. Uh, be a social marketer for your research. If you publish an article, don't be shy. Say to the world, look at this article. I published a good article, read it, cite it. You can send this to your people in your area. Look, I published this article. I would like you please read and cite where appropriate. It's perfectly fine. Put it in your social media in other places. Cite others so that you'll be also cited too. Social media is also a good tool for me. I've, I've made a lot of great uh, contacts from social media. Please use it also, especially young scholars. Use it as a professional uh, portfolio. And in conclusion, I would like to tell you that research is needs to be a pipeline. As you can see, this is a petroleum pipeline. There is gas inside. When they push this uh, gas, 
from this side of the pipe. By the time it goes to this side, it takes long time, right? This is the research pipeline. So some of them in your head, this is your idea, research idea. Some of them you start actually the, the subject and the research questions, review literature, data collection, data analysis, writing the discussion, submitting the journal, dating the reviewers. So you need to have in different stages the paper, four or five, so that you have a steady publication uh, thing. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope I didn't bore you, make you sleep. Uh, it's late here in Florida. Uh, these are my social media accounts. Feel free to connect with me. Of course, during now we will have some question answers, but even if, if I don't answer anything that you may get to ask, I'm happy to be connected to you in those channels that you see on there. Again, thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share my knowledge. Thank you, Prof. Chihan, for such a great sharing about the common reasons for paper rejections in high-impact journals. Thank you for sharing all the tips too, Prof. I believe that all the participants learned a lot from you today. Um, now, Prof, uh, we, will, uh, we will go to a uh, uh, question and answer session. So, Prof will answer some questions from audiences that were sent to us during the presentation. So, our team has selected some questions. So the first question is, what is your opinion on high similarity index in the submitted manuscript from the author's own thesis? Will you reject or ask the author to revise? Very good question. Whoever asked that question is a very, very good question. So here's the deal. Remember, I told you that we are actually submitting when we receive an article, we submit that to turn it in immediately. That's number one. And we also use authenticate. There are two times. We do it in the beginning, we do it then. So if in the beginning, a, a research similarity index comes 40%, and I cannot know who this belonged to, right? And then I will reject the paper. Usually we don't reject. I usually don't reject because I know that sometimes what this, whoever asked this question uh, says happens. So I always give the authors a chance to explain to me. I say to them that your paper received a similarity index of 40%, one source 30%, 35% coming. Please let me know why this is the case. Because just like you said, so if this is the case, if somebody uses it, their thesis, which is by the way, perfect, they should do it, they should utilize their thesis, their dissertation to convert them into uh, at least one paper, in some cases, two or three papers. There are three uh, article dissertations as well. Explain this to the editor. Uh, this is the best place in the cover letter. Say that, dear editor, um, this particular article is based on my dissertation, which was also submitted to this university in the similarity index, you may find this and here's the reason. If I get this one from an author, I will definitely not reject and proceed with the uh, process, whatever that process might be. So that's a good question uh, and it's perfectly fine. Just explain to the editor, they should be able to um, pr uh, continue with the process. Not accept, of course, but continue with the process. Okay, thank you, Prof. Okay, moving on to the second question. What are the implications of restriction to the author? What are the implications of what? Retraction. Just now you share about. Oh yeah, retraction. Yeah. To the to the authors. Yes, to the author because the paper is already retracted. Not bad. I mean, not bad. I mean, every university is different. In some universities, if they falsify the research, they may be even fired. I mean, in my university, if something like this happens. I will lose my job. I mean, uh, it's very serious. So in some universities, maybe, and depending upon what the reason is, okay, self-pleasurism, maybe, um, it, you know, you may not be fired from your university, but then you will be some precautions, but it, it's not good. Obviously it's embarrassing, right? You don't wanna be in that kind of situation. So that's why I'm telling you that there is no shortcut. Research publication is not a destination. You can't just say that I am done. I, I've, I've done everything. No, there is no finish in learning. I mean, I am even learning today 
in the seminar as I am trying to convey my knowledge to you. Today, we just finished a conference last week. I was in another conference. So we just keep learning. So that's why do it the right way. Do it in a digestive. So don't eat all at once. Eat slowly, digest. This is what I'm talking about. Read, read, read. As you read, you learn more. I want to tell you one more thing about this uh, retraction thing that if you are in a hurry, if you don't work on time, and then when you finally say, oh my God, I need to graduate. I need to write this paper. I need to submit my promotion. Uh, and then you immediately start doing it quickly. And then of course these mistakes then happen. Sometimes they are very appealing to you because it's quick. Um, so be careful. Can't agree more with you, Prof. We have to do it the right way. Okay, uh, question number three. What is the ideal number of co-authors in a research publication? There is no magic number. I mean, I've seen papers, I, I guess the, the maximum that I have published in JHTT, I'm not, don't remember if it was JHTT, but it was 10 people, which is kind of too much. Although it depends on the, the, the field. In medical field, my brother uh, is brain surgeon. I know that he has published papers with 30 people on it but it's a lab, you know, they are doing this in the hospital. There is a big team that are working for years on one particular medicine or procedure, whatever. So in those kind of fields, it's okay. But in social sciences, I would say that the sweet spot, okay, no more than six, six probably is the maximum, I will say five, four. Um, and of course there is no again number you need to bring in people that's going to contribute to the research study. Uh, that's why we were talking about this, you know, for example, copy editing research methods, review literature. Somebody's very good in review literature, so bring that person in. Somebody's very good in this topic uh, or in the methodology that you are going to use, bring that person in. So that's the idea. But again, no number that I can tell you, but I, I usually would not want to be more than six people team okay thank you Prof. okay question number four some journals give an option to use crowdsourcing reviewer it is a good is it a good idea to choose this option crowdsourcing reviewer i think uh what this person is meaning that some journals ask you to give them reviewers, the name of reviewers. Maybe this is what uh, that person is um, asking. Crowdsourcing reviewing, I think hopefully they're not talking about money, like giving money to other, um, I, I'm not really familiar with, uh, with this concept, but uh, if that crowdsourcing reviewer uh, is paying somebody to, to get reviews. I'm not really sure about this model. So whoever asked that question, if you please either write on the chat or email me, I would love to learn about this. I really don't know crowdsourcing reviewing. I know that some journals are actually asking you, give me two, three reviewer names. Mm -hmm. uh, so that one I've seen, although I don't really like it too much because um, some journal editors ask for these reviews, but they send them another paper, not their paper. And so this is their way of getting reviewers, because if you do that, you will ask your friend, hey, look, this journal is going to send you a paper, please accept it. Uh, and then so this is one way of doing it. Doing, but, you know, I didn't say this to, to, to everybody here, but please review papers, especially junior researchers. Even if you're a PhD student, ask editors of some of the journals, tell them that you would like to review papers uh, as, an, as a, just a service. Because when you start reviewing papers, this is where A, you keep it up to speed because you get the most cutting edge early on. You know what people are working on. Number two is that you really learn well from, these, um, from this experience. So I encourage, and don't, don't be shy, even ask the top, uh, tier journals, editors, ask them to be a reviewer, ad hoc reviewer. And hopefully that you are going to be uh, a, in, in the editorial team later on as you start doing these things. So it's very, very good practice for you to learn 
uh, about research publishing. Okay, thank you, Prof. Okay, uh, next question, question number five. Is it true that if we have sent a paper and the paper is rejected, we will be blacklisted to submit again? No, 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 absolutely no, absolutely no. But what happens sometimes is this, you submit an article, let's say to my journal, and for whatever reason that you got rejected, and then you go and submit to another journal. And if you do this, if you submit the same article without changing anything, especially when we reject, we normally give some feedback to you. And then you need to look at that feedback and make some modifications. You know what happens? So you take this paper from this journal, reject it. You submit this to this journal. So I sent this to reviewer A. This journal will also send it to reviewer A. So that reviewer A will be the same. So the same reviewer will get both papers because he or she may be serving as a reviewer for both journals. When this happens, the reviewer will immediately say, look, I read this paper earlier and I rejected this paper. This paper has no um, modification. They didn't do anything. So for that reason, there is no blacklist uh, or whatsoever. I don't even know. Sometimes I don't even remember what I reject, uh, just simply reject, right? Look at that, that one. So, but what one thing that makes sure that you make some modifications to paper, especially if the feedback that you got makes sense to you. Okay, Prof, uh, thank you. Question number six, how long is the process of peer review and correction after rejection before the publication of journals? Good question also. Again, there is not really a set number. As the JHTT, we try to make everything that we can to uh, reduce this, this speed. When we send a paper to reviewers, we give them usually one month to review. So you can just immediately put one month. And, and remember, sometimes it takes us one or two weeks to process articles. So that's already one and a half month. And then um, sometimes the reviewers do not get back to you. Um, you know, you would not believe me, but for to find two or th three reviewers for a paper, sometimes I send 10 or sometimes even 15 invitations to reviewers. Uh, many people reject, many people don't even answer uh, our invitation. And for that reason, it's quite challenging. So I would say, that if you do not hear anything from the journal, of course, now with the submission systems, you can actually check. If you submit it and it says that editorial check after two weeks, you can send an email to the editor. So that's perfectly fine or editorial assistant for that matter, just to make sure that there's no problem with the paper or they didn't forget. Sometimes, you know, I'll just give you one example. One author was angry with me. Uh, he has submitted an article and he did not hear anything for two months. Uh, not even reviewer assignment. We didn't even assign to a reviewer. So I checked this article and I found out that he has submitted this article to one of the special issues that we had two years ago. But, and you know, when he was submitting, he sees that as one of the uh, special issues that was out there, it was not deleted from the system. And nobody has seen, I didn't see it, editorial assistants didn't see it. Nobody has seen it. So uh, for that reason, we didn't look at it. Had he has, had he sent us an email two weeks or three weeks later, why that my paper or is there any problem? Like you, you don't need to be careful, right? You don't need to, how come you cannot do anything to my paper? This is ridiculous. Don't have a language like this, instead more, constructive say that dear editor i submitted this article i'm checking the status for three weeks it did not change it's still waiting for uh editor assignment uh is there a problem is there anything that i can do to speed up this process so that this is a good language uh to speak so for that reason um be proactive just don't submit and forget about it you can send uh some reminders to editors to be able to just check the status 
Okay, next question. For high impact journals, which method is preferred? Qualitative or quantitative? Do cross-sectional papers have chance to be published in high impact journals? Uh, <clears throat> another good question. <clears throat> when we look at the statistics in the top tier journals, predominantly it's quantitative articles, predominantly. I, I wanna tell you that maybe even 80% of these articles are quantitative. So what does this tell you? That they like quantitative articles or the quantitative articles are a little bit easier uh, than uh, qualitative articles. Although qualitative articles are becoming now uh, more accepted, especially it uses a robust and a very good methodology. So whatever that might be, and there's very good uh, experts on qualitative research. One of them is Rob Nawaz Lodhi. Uh, he's from Pakistan and he's using NBIBO, for example, as software. He's doing sophisticated analysis using qualitative data. So things like this, they get published, definitely. But if um, one of the best things I think is mixed methodology. I like mixed methodology quite a bit because it will give the people, um, it, it's going to actually give you to be able to get the best of the both worlds. Uh, I'll give you one quick example from a recent, one of uh, my colleagues, uh, students actually, another university now, uh, she and I and another person are doing a study where we are using qualitative method uh, to be able to analyze the restaurant pictures. And based on that one, we built a quantitative conjoint analysis study. So, and then this will also even increase your chances of being accepted into even higher level, FT50, uh, UD, uh, UTD uh, listings journals. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, next question. What are the standard journal publication fees? Is it a normal practice for high impact journals? I have published, I think, 70 plus, more than 70 articles peer reviewed I'm talking about. Not a single of them are paid. I did not pay any money whatsoever. So I just don't do it. But should you not do it? When there's so many free journals, I say free meaning that free to publish, right? Maybe not free to access as an author, uh, as a reader, but free to publish. I really don't see any value in my opinion, submitting to a paid journal. All, not all paid journals are predators. So there are some good journals, um, you know, if you want to do it, you can do it. But I've seen as high as $10,000, $3,000, $300, $200, I simply don't do it. And my, if you ask my recommendation, uh, there are so many good journals that doesn't cost you any money. Just go and publish in them. Okay, next question, question number nine. How long is the average duration of publishing for Q1 journal or high impact journal? Um, I think that this person is asking about how long does it take to yeah, get the average in a Q1 journal. Mm -hmm. Again, this really depends. I mean, there are so some journals. By the way, for GHTT, uh, we just implemented new associate editors. Uh, for this reason, we want to make this as quickly as possible because we now receive so many articles in uh, submissions. For that reason, we would like to do this. Um, I would like to, um, you know, ask the authors, if you are curious about this, many journals put their submitted, revised and published dates. Many of them do publish this one in their articles in the first page. Just looking there, if you see that usually from the date that it's submitted and the date that's published, it's two years, that means that it's gonna take a long time. Some journals actually are very robust. 
Uh, and like I said, you can learn about this from the articles itself because it has the dates there. But, but let me just give you, I don't think that it will take less than six months, the whole process, that, that, that's for sure. Thank you, Prof. And we have for today, I know you have reminded us to submit to one journal at, one, at a time, but due to the time constraint, would you advise sending articles to three to five journals at one go? Oh, no, absolutely. No. Don't do it. I don't think that it's good. I mean, it, it's really not good. This is not a good practice. Um, obviously, if you choose to do so, you can do it. Um, and th th some many different reasons. One is that if you accepted more than one journal, if you forget that you submitted to this, and then see, this is one of the retraction uh, reasons as well too. And then also remember those journals may be utilizing the same reviewers if, because every journal says one of the number one things that you say that this is original and is not submitted or published elsewhere, right? You accept this. So if you were to submit two or three journals, because I know what you're trying to do. The idea is to be able to save time Right, because if you wait for one journal, six months, one year, it's rejected, then another one. That's why I show you the pipeline. Remember that pipeline? Make a research pipeline. Don't just do one paper, submit and wait. So create one paper. When this paper is being submitted, you should have two, three in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. One of them is in the idea stage in your mind. What am I gonna do next paper? The other one is you are writing the review literature. That's why I want to tell the participants here that create research teams. These research teams are perfect. Maybe four people, three people, or five people. You get together, you meet in Zoom. Now it's easier to meet. And then you create a research stream. You say, uh, Miss Noor, we are going to do a paper with you. So in the first paper, here's a title you are going to lead this paper. So you're gonna do the big chunk. And then this is your responsibility. I will help you with this. Second article, I will lead. The third article, you will lead. And they will all interconnect with each other. So this way you have a pipeline. So when you submit to a journal, one journal, the other one is coming, the other one is coming. So you will not really have this problem. If you look at my trajectory, my research trajectory, uh, about 70 plus papers, uh, so that's about three to four papers a year. If you look at 20 years uh, in my, if I publish three papers in 20 years, because I'm in academia for 20 years, that's 60. That means that I publish 3.5 papers a year. So that will tell you about the pipeline, right? So that's, that's healthy. I mean, I'm not saying I'm good, but Faizan Ali, for example, published already 60 papers. He's only a five year um, you know, academician. So by the time he is in my stage, he's probably going to publish 200, 300. It's just different, but it's good to have pipelines. So please do not submit to three, four journals at the same time. Thank you, Prof. I myself use the same strategy as you to have the research team and the research pipeline and everything. Okay, thank you, Prof, for responding to all the questions. Your answer are very insightful. It was a pleasure to have you with us today. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up our webinar. Our, on behalf of the entire committee member of the International Webinar on Publishing in High Impact Journals webinar series, Common Reasons for Paper Rejections in High Impact Journals, we would like to thank Professor Dr. Chihan Kobadoglu for our insightful presentation and your time to present in this webinar. We will have a photo session before we display the QR code for attendance and e certification. So everyone, please switch on your camera and smile.
Okay, thank you everyone. To all attendees, don't forget to scan the QR code shows on the screen and fill out the attendance form. We will provide uh, an e-certification as a token of appreciation for participating in the webinar. It was a pleasure to host this webinar and I wish you all a pleasant day. See you in our next webinar series. Thank you.